The season of your grace is upon us. The snow may linger in some corners of our backyards, and we may yet return for a while. The snow may yet return, but so shall we. For you, Lord, are waiting. You, Lord, are present. And so now we wait, Lord, upon your word for us. We worship you in wonder and with awe, and with generations past and generations yet unborn. We continue in the words your Son taught us together to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. A warm welcome to all this morning, whether gathered here in the sanctuary or online. We are gathered by the Holy Spirit in the name of Christ. And on behalf of the elders, I welcome all. Most of the announcements are printed in the order of service that is before you. And if you're joining us online, the um, announcements are printed in the bulletin posted on the church website. So you'll be able to um, see them there. And in fact, they're more convenient on the website because all the hyperlinks are active and you can just go immediately to the pages identified. Tuesday evening, we continue a study of the gospel themes as um, highlighted in Victor Hugo's um, novel, um, Les Miserables. Um, Wednesday evening, we continue a series of studies with uh, Professor Bill Morrow on some of the difficult texts of the Old Testament. And this Wednesday, uh, Jacob, does God reward tricksters? How could God include Jacob as a chosen one? Not in the bulletin, because the minister forgot. This Thursday morning, we have our uh, monthly morning Bible study um, by Zoom. We're continuing to read through the Sermon on the Mount together. We're beginning the, um, chapter 7, and the words that begin that chapter, do not judge so that ye not be judged. Just contact me by email to get a, the invitation for the Zoom link. And you'll also note there are two invitations from the National Church. One is to gather with our current moderator, the Reverend Amanda Curry, on the Sunday after Easter, April the 11th, for an hour um, with Presbyterians from across Canada um, embarking upon a journey together for the season of Easter. Also um, available are interviews with the three individuals who've allowed their name to stand um, to be considered as moderator to be elected this coming June by General Assembly. A wonderful selection of three individuals, one who is a member of the First Nations based in um, Regina, one who um, came to Canada um, from Jamaica and is a minister in Toronto, and another who is a pastor um, and professor at Tyndale um, University. Wonderful interviews, very interesting. These are the announcements. We continue now with a time with the children. Good morning. Thanks for being here. I, I have three things I'd like to show you. The first thing is a piece of wood that I picked up. A piece of wood, yes. I picked it up along um, the shores of Lake Ontario, Breakwater Park. I picked it up, and you can see it had been in the water. It had fallen off a tree a long time ago, been in the water for a while. All the bark has come off, but it's solid. It's solid. It's pretty, but really not much use the way it is other than to look at it. Next thing I want to show you is also made of wood. 
That's a stick, and this is also a stick. It's a stick of wood also, but if you open it up, it's empty. And yes, it's a recorder. If I put it underneath my mask and I blow on it, it makes noise. Now that's a stick, and this is a stick. What's the difference? This one has been emptied in the middle, and wind can go through it. Okay, two sticks, and a third. Another piece of wood, and it also has been shaped, and it also is hollow in the center. And you know what it is. What is it? A pepper shaker, exactly. At the dinner table, you turn the top, and oh, pepper comes out and makes your meal taste, or my meal at least, taste even better. So, a piece of wood that's been emptied out in the middle and helps my meals taste better. A piece of wood that's been emptied out and makes my life filled with beauty, with music. And a piece of wood that's just a piece of wood. You know, one thing in life, sometimes when we feel empty inside, God's able to fill us, to blow Holy Spirit through us, to make the lives of others beautiful, like music, or to put something in us that comes out of us, like pepper on a meal, that makes other lives more tasty, more exciting, more interesting. When we feel empty, God can fill us with something good for others. And that's why we're here. We don't want to be just a stick. We want to be beautiful, and we want to make life interesting for other people. So we empty ourselves Sunday morning to let God fill us. It's wonderful to be here together. Okay. We continue now with um, a litany that's prepared by Presbyterian World Service and Development for us. On the back, um, it highlights some of the work that we support through PWS and D, through our offerings Sunday by Sunday that are specially designated mission. In this case, um, helping women in Ghana who have been accused of witchcraft in their villages and therefore shunned and banned and left without support. In that culture, when something bad or unexplained happens in the community, an individual is accused of being a witch and bringing the evil upon them, and it's usually women. So here the church is able to provide refuge and security for these women, the church in Ghana, and we, the church in Canada, support them through PWS and D. But Crystal, I will invite you to come to the lectern and lead us in this litany. Um, Crystal will read the words in bold, and we will continue um, with the words for the people. The journey to Jerusalem is long, but this is a wilderness, this is a world, wilderness journey, and we are not always comfortable, but we trust and we preserve. We preserve. are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. God's people are familiar with the wilderness. After Egypt, they wandered in hunger and in thirst, confused and tired, waiting for the promised land. Our destination is different. We aim for Jerusalem, where all ends, and where there will be new beginnings. We are pilgrims on a journey. We are travelers on the road. Let us pray. God of all the wilderness, give us strength when we wander, when we stray and grieve, hunger and thirst. You have promised to make water spring up in the desert, quench our thirst, feed us with manna, Strengthen us when we are tired or lack trust. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good job. You're right. This morning we have two uh, scripture lessons. 
the um, second reading reminds us that when God speaks by the Holy Spirit through Holy Scripture, what we hear, if we're truly listening, is always a challenge. When we are despairing, God challenges the despair that we're experiencing with words of assurance and purpose. And when we are enjoying some semblance of security, God challenges us to go deeper and broader. The first reading is taken from the gospel according to Mark, the earliest of the gospels that was um, put together in the New Testament. And in this part of our journey through the gospel of Mark, we're looking at some of the um, paragraphs highlighting sayings of Jesus or particular words. So, you remember in the day of transfiguration, it is good for us to be here. Then I believe, help my unbelief. And then whoever must be, wants to be first must be servant of all. And whoever is not against us is for us. Now we come with Jesus continuing his teachings that to show respect of God, we need to live in such a way that we respect others around us. To respect the Holy One is to respect the human ones. It's as children, he says, that we must enter the kingdom of God, trusting in God and God alone. And now he's approached by someone with a question about eternal life. I invite Derek to lead us in both these readings. Let us pray. Our Father, your word instructs, guides, and encourages us. We thank you in the name of our Lord Christ Jesus. Our first reading is taken from Mark uh, chapter 10, uh, starting at verse 17. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him and asked him, Good teacher, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus said to him, Why do you call me good? No one is good but God alone. You know the commandments. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. He said to him, Teacher, I have kept all these uh, since my youth. Jesus, looking at him, loved him and said, You lack one thing. Go sell what you own and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come, follow me. When he heard this, he was shocked and went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Our second reading is from Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12 to 16. Indeed, the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing until it divides soul from spirit, joints from marrow. It is able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. And before him no creature is hidden, but all are naked and laid bare to the eyes of the one to whom we must render an account. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast to our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who in every respect has been tested as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore approach the throne of grace with boldness so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. And we know that God will add his blessing to the reading of this, his word. Right. 
Let us pray. Lord God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of our hearts be found now acceptable in your sight. You who are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. I begin the preparation of a sermon early in the week. The text for the sermon is selected usually at least a month in advance. We're currently in the center, uh, actually coming near the end of a series in the Gospel according to Mark, the sayings of our Lord. But on Monday, I send suggestions to John as director of music for hymns that I think might fit the theme for the coming Sunday. On Tuesday, I send most of the content for the bulletin to Lori Kim in the office for preparation. That then is finalized and printed on Thursday morning. But all through the week, and particularly increasingly towards the end of the week, these scripture passages are on my mind and heart as I work towards a sermon. I read commentaries that others have written through the ages on the passage. I continue with the novel that I'm reading and the news feeds that I receive. There are also meetings, conversations around a table of business, sometimes discussion groups, Bible studies, and conversations with individuals, with you. All of this is going on as I am thinking about the sermon and informing me and expanding my thoughts. Well, this morning, we come to a passage that I have been contemplating all week. It begins with the words, as he was setting out on a journey. The he, of course, is Jesus. And we know exactly what journey this is. It's a journey to Jerusalem. It's a journey to the cross. We know that because he's already told that to his followers at the time. As he was setting out on a journey, a man ran up and knelt before him. And he asked a question that obviously was burning within him, that just needed to come out. This is an important story, obviously important story. It was important for the first Christians. They treasured this story. They, they treasured it for years, passing it on one to the other in their Sabbath morn services, house gatherings. So much so that decades later, when Mark came to compile these stories of the earthly life of Jesus into the gospel according to Mark, it was included. And not just in Mark, but also in Matthew and in Luke. One of those rare scenes, including it in all three. The question that this man asks has been translated into English as good teacher. What must I do to inherit eternal life? 
Like many Jewish people of the day, this man believed that a day was coming when the reign of God would be known, when a new age would begin, a new age that we've filled finally with justice and peace, in which the righteous dead would be raised. It wasn't so much a question of going to heaven, as we might presume today, as much as this earth being renewed. Jesus replies to the question. He heeds the man and his burning, burning question. And he responds, you know the commandments. And interestingly enough, Jesus skips over the first table of the commandments from those two tablets of Moses. Jesus skips over the commandments that talk about putting God first, having no idols, not speaking God's name in vain, honoring the Sabbath. When Jesus says, you know the commandments, he goes immediately to the second table, which are the commandments describing how we are to live with each other as God's people. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness. You shall not defraud. Honor your father and mother. As if Jesus wanted to say, the way you will honor the Holy One is how you will honor other human ones. The individual who's asked the question hears the rep response and blurts out with joy. You can just hear it. I have kept these all since my youth. As if to say, I am fulfilling these commandments. Count me in. And Jesus hears that response. And we're told, quote, looking at him, Jesus loved him. This is the first and only time in the gospel, according to Mark, that we're told of Jesus loving an individual. Jesus was obviously moved by the sincerity and commitment of this man. So much so, so much did Jesus love this man that Jesus continued. He continued by clarifying what was involved, how the love of God and the love of neighbor were entwined. Jesus continued and said, you lack one thing. In the Globe and Mail recently, there were um, paragraphs by nine individual Canadians who had been asked to look back over the past 12 months of COVID-19 and share how they thought the pandemic was going to change their lives. Each was confined to just a short paragraph. It was wonderful. Bonnie Henry, BC Officer of Health. Over the past year, we have seen that every act of kindness, whether large or small, has made an outsized difference in people's lives. And while we can't always know precisely what another person is dealing with, we can always choose to respond with compassion. In essence, acknowledging another's suffering. And Chris Hatfield, astronaut, who in his third space journey spent over half a year in, away from this Earth, he acknowledged that while he was away, things had changed. Babies were born, close friends had died, new technologies were being adopted. And then he said, but I changed too. There's been time to try new things, to introspect, to read, to see and learn. Post-COVID-19, I'm going to pretend my spaceship just landed here and be an explorer. I want to see all the familiar places and faces through new eyes. I'll be very happy to see COVID-19 in the past tense, but even happier to see this world anew. What is it that we will see that we missed before 
or that we realize now we took for granted? What will we appreciate anew? The expressions of faces without masks, the hug of a family member or the casual, intimate company of a friend, the ability to work together around a table in the office or invite others to share a meal at home. Well, Jesus responds to this individual's request for help and reveals what this man does not understand about himself for himself. Jesus says, you lack one thing. Go, sell what you own, and give the money to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven. Then come and follow me. Ever since these words have been spoken, we have struggled with them. Of that individual, we're told he was shocked, as was everybody who heard these words of Jesus. We're told in the passage that comes right after that the disciples were perplexed and greatly astounded. And he had a right to be shocked, and they had a right to be perplexed and astounded because it made absolutely no sense relative to what had come prior. You remember how Moses, about to lay himself down and the people to cross over the Jordan into the Promised Land, his last, his last words of advice and of guidance, the Lord will make you abound in prosperity. It was common wisdom that the, quote, blessing of the Lord makes rich, and the Lord adds no sorrow to it. Wealth was a sign of God's blessing. How could anyone make sense of these words of Jesus? Go, sell all that you have and give to the poor. The painting before you this morning is by a German artist by the name of Heinrich Hoffmann, influential in the 19th century. I found it interesting to note that after the death of his mother in the year 1854, Hoffman painted, and the first canvas he painted after his mother's death was the burial of Jesus. And that set him on a path, the rest of his artistic career, painting scenes of the life, the earthly life of Jesus that became very widely appreciated and known. Well, in this scene, Jesus has just spoken these words, you lack one thing, and the individual is just beginning to process these words. You can see his robes are clearly of wealth, with even an embellished hat to augment his social stature. And his arm is akimbo, in a posture of casual self-importance. He's just beginning to enter into a realization of how challenging are these words that he's now hearing in response to his question. And, as we heard Derek read, it's a challenge that in the end, after this image of this canvas, he declines. The risk he obviously feels may not be worth it. He's not up to it. We're told he went away grieving, for he had many possessions. Ever since Jesus spoke these words, we have struggled with them. We've tried to make sense of them, and various broad streams of interpretation have emerged. There is the literal reading, which is, I believe, what the first Christians heard and lived by, that the risen Lord would return and we are to be ready. We are to make ready our lives now for his imminent return. And that means clearing a space, clearing all secondary priorities that could so easily become first priorities other than Jesus the Christ. It's something that we see recorded in 
the Acts of the Apostles, just after the descent of the Holy Spirit. We are told that all who believed were together and had all things in common. They would sell their possessions and goods and distribute the proceeds to all as any had need. There is this literal interpretation of Jesus' words. There's also a, a restrictive reading that these words, they were meant for that man. And they are meant for individuals, but not all. It's not a mandate, a commandment for all followers of Jesus. This is, of course, the basis of individuals who feel called into a vocation. The religious orders of the Roman Catholic Church to this day, a vow of poverty, a vow to give up everything to serve Christ and his poor. There is a literal, there is a restrictive, but there's also a symbolic interpretation. This is a calling that applies to all Christians, but not literally. Jesus commanded this man to give up all that he owned because for this man, his possessions had possessed him. For other Christians, other things, other routines, other people, they possess them, and they need to give those up. So in other words, this is a symbolic commandment, and it may be different for each of us. Whatever we make of it, these interpretations and many sub-interpretations, they highlight the fact that we are challenged. We're challenged to consider our relationship with God and how it relates to our relationship with money, especially today when money has such a, a high influence and priority in our culture. How is it that we can live for God and live amongst money and not be owned by it? How can we live in the present age to welcome the age to come, to be ready for it? For it will come, and it will come unawares. At Christmas, my brother gave me a gift certificate to Novel Idea Bookshop on Princess Street, and just over a week ago, I walked in and picked up a, a couple of novels spontaneously reading just the, uh, the inside flap. Well, I just finished Midnight Library by Matt Haig. When I got home and opened it up, I wondered about my choice. The first sentence begins, 19 years before she decided to die, and I thought, oh my, this doesn't sound like much of a balance, the balance that I need in these hard days. 19 years before she decided to die. It's the story of a young woman whose depression had just become too much. And we experience her emotions as she relates them in these 19 days. She's filled with regret by many of the decisions that she had made and feels no hope for the future. She swallows a fistful of sleeping pills on that 19th day. And she enters into a peculiar, particular existence that appears to be something like the school library that she had known when she was younger. It was a safe place and a place filled with wonder. And each book in this library is actually a variation on what her life could have been if she had made different decisions along the way over those 30-some years. She has the opportunity to take a book off the shelf, enter into that life and explore it, and then another book and life and then another book, and life. And she learns, eventually, that some of the decisions of which she most despaired, most regretted, in fact, were good decisions in the long term. For example, she had lived with such regret that she did not marry Dan. But he, in fact, turned out to be an obnoxious and controlling partner. 
And she comes to regret other decisions, other decisions that she could have made and didn't. In the end, she realizes during this time in the library that life is filled with life. And she wants to be alive. And she's given the opportunity to return and to be roused sufficiently from her medically and drug-induced slumber to call for help and indeed begin again. I wonder, going back to the scene of Mark, I wonder what this man thought of his decision in the days and years after this encounter with Jesus. I wonder if he had the commitment and the courage to revisit that challenge and make a different choice. More importantly than the challenge given to that man is the challenge that comes to us. It comes to us today. Who knows what days or years remain to any one of us? And there is little possibility of a midnight library being more than wishful thinking for us. We have to discern rightly today. What do we make of Jesus' words? Whether general, restrictive, or symbolic, there's no denying that how we live with our wealth has eternal consequences as individuals and as a nation. And this question is not only before us this particular Sunday because we have come to chapter 10 of the Gospel according to Mark. You realize this question is before us every Sunday at St. Andrew's Presbyterian Church, Kingston. Under the great rose window at the back of the sanctuary are a row of other windows. I'd invite you to turn around if you're in the sanctuary right now. Look at the great rose window and look underneath the five windows, the row of five windows, and look at the center window between the birth of Jesus on the right and the ascension of Jesus on the left is a window modeled on the painting of Heinrich Holman that we have been looking at. Every Sunday after the worship of God, as we leave this sanctuary for a week in the service of God, that window is before us. So this Jesus is whispering this very day, you lack one thing. Yes, we can know a relationship with God in Christ, one that begins in this life and continues eternally. Yes, it is a relationship in which God will be honored now, but as God has asked to be honored, as God has demanded to be honored by Christians caring for the poor, so now our arms are akimbo. Our heads are slightly tilted. And we ponder our response. Thanks be to God. Amen.
For our prayers of thanksgiving and intercession this morning, I would like to acknowledge that it was a year ago tomorrow that we canceled our first service of worship here at St. Andrews in Kingston. The very next Sunday, we went for the first time online, but it's been a year now. It's been a year filled in so many different ways for each of us and all of us together. And we will be able to offer up our, our prayers and our thoughts personal. But I'd like to share with you just a few um, other vignettes into which I enter into this time of prayer. There was an individual in Whitby this past uh, week or so that I read of who heard the triangle in the fir for the first time during the Ode to Joy of Beethoven's Ninth Symphony. And he wrote about how, quote, classical music surrounds me now all during the day and night before I go to sleep. No matter the news of the latest catastrophe, this music helps me through, so I'm never overwhelmed by grief or anxiety. It happens that he's director of music of his church as well. But it was that hearing the triangle, the small instrument inserted into this amazing piece, choral and instrumental, by a man who was practically deaf, that just made him aware of the miracles, the grace, the goodness that surrounds him. I read a death notice recently of a man who was a spouse, a father, a grandfather, a physician, and it mentioned in this notice that, quote, when he, as a child, had asked his father why he couldn't simply have inherited the knowledge that the father had attained, his father replied, because then you would inherit my prejudices. And his own wisdom at the end of his life, there is no greater privilege than to help another human being through their life. I invite you to join with me in prayer. Let us pray. Holy One, it has been a year. A year since the pandemic hit this part of the world, and we realize that for the safety of each other and all our neighbors, we suddenly became a congregation that would not congregate. Well, not in person, at least. We have continued to worship, thanks to online services. We have continued to study the Bible, gather for discussions and times of fellowship, and even survive an annual general meeting, thanks to Zoom. It's not the same. But then nothing in life stays the same, not even us. And we have found ways to live as Jesus' disciples and to share your love with each other and all through it all. We asked for strength and a pandemic came upon us that revealed our frailties as individuals and as a nation. We asked for wisdom and never have we realized how much we still lack it. We asked for courage and our fears and anxiety only increased. We asked for love and all sorts of individuals and whole peoples were raised up for us to acknowledge and accompany. We asked for justice and and we've been called ourselves to be just and to lead with integrity and compassion. Lord, we received nothing of which we asked or wanted. And yet we've received everything that we needed. And for this, we give you thanks. You are a God of infinite compassion and mercy we pray, receive our hearts as they are filled to overflowing 
with a flood of emotions from this past year. Fear and sorrow and grief, but also endurance, appreciation, relief, and hope. For the families of all who have died, who've been unable yet to mourn, may they know comfort. For healthcare workers persevering in the battle with this disease, may they know strength and safety. For the scientists, grocery clerks, the delivery drivers, the teachers, may they know safety and appreciation. For government and leaders of every sort, we ask your wisdom. And for all facing the relentless uncertainties that continue, the parents worried about the education of their children, students studying at university with little social interaction, owners of businesses at the breaking point, individuals suddenly without employment or income, all overwhelmed by emotional exhaustion, physical isolation, families separated out of mutual care, Households together in which frustration severs, even strikes. Oh God, we lift them up to you now. In this moment of silence, hear our prayers personal. Oh God, as we lift them up to you, we lift also ourselves. Through these masks that we wear for mutual care, it's been hard to recognize each other. It's been hard to communicate. It's been hard to feel fully present, even when with others. But through my mask, you see when I smile or scowl. Through my mask, you hear when I whisper a brief prayer or mutter a muffled curse. We may not see or hear or know, but you do. So now when we look forward to the day when these masks can fall from our faces, will our eyes and ears be stronger, able to see and hear the smiles and frowns, the cries and whispers of those who fill our lives? Who will make our lives worth living? Who are waiting for our company and care in the name of Christ? God, you are with us all the time. All the time, you are with us. Yes, today we remember. We remember how things used to be. We remember how many things have gone past us this year the things we've missed, the people we've lost. Today we remember, but we also hope. We hope for healing. We hope for vaccines. We hope for wisdom and new beginnings and new directions. And today, Lord, we would share. We would share our trust in you. We would share our joys and sorrows with each other. We would share our visions for the future of the whole world. God, you are with us all the time. All the time, you are with us. You are with us as we remember and hope and share. I pray this and much more in the name of Jesus. Amen. Lord of all power, I give you my life. Joyful obedience. 
Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord be kind and gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you peace. Amen. Thank you.